Good morning, evening, day, night, wherever you are. Um, my name is Evelyn Decker and I'm very happy to, um, to be allowed to, to give a short introduction uh, and to open uh, this session. And of course, that's to, um, to uh, honor our uh, president of the working group of the Imaging Enhanced uh, Endoscopy and Endoscopic Therapy Working Group, which is um, Heiko Paul. Heiko has been the chair for um, this working group um, since uh, many years. Actually, the working group was uh, started in 2013 uh, by David Hewitt, but in uh, 2015, Heiko joined uh, David as a, as a co-chair. They chaired uh, um, the, the group together, and um, uh, from 2019 on, he resumed um, the sole chairmanship of this group until um, today. Um, the working group was renamed because we thought it would be timely um, uh, to uh, add the endoscopic therapy to the just imaging part of the, um, of the working group. Um, and today, actually, it's, uh, it's Heiko's uh, last day as a chair because he will hand over to the new two chairs of the working group, Daniel from Brenton and uh, Yuichi Mori. Um, Heiko uh, has been uh, a long-standing friend of mine. Uh, we've been seeing each other at uh, various conferences. Uh, we have um, uh, both joined the editorial board of uh, Endoscopy together with Raf Bishops, um, as in this slide. Um, and of course, I would like to thank um, uh, Heiko for all his work he's been doing for this working group. It's been a great success with all the, um, the meetings he has uh, arranged, um, six in total, um, with all the different nice discussions and, uh, uh, um, and work uh, we have been doing. However, I also um, am sure it's not a goodbye. I remember very well um, uh, the meeting we had in my city in Amsterdam, where you can see Heiko in the boat here on the far end. And this was later at night. And of course, I don't remember exactly what was in the shopping bags, but for sure we had a good time. So I'm sure Heiko will, be, will remain very active um, in the endoscopy world and ho hopefully also with us, um, with the WEO CRC screening group. I wish um, you all a very pleasant um, and um, interesting um, uh, webinar today. And I like to hand over now to the, to the current chairs. Thank you. Um, Evelyn, this was, a, I hope I'm, I can be heard. This was yes. uh, very nice. Thank you. I didn't expect that to happen, particularly not to see my very old image of being very young. So, um, but nice memories. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and honor inspiring to uh, work as a co-chair. And uh, I think the most important thing was just to collaborate and to exchange ideas and 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 enjoy it. And then overall with the idea of moving the field forward. And, and we had uh, more than one good collaboration coming out of this. And, and, and I think I always saw it as a goal to have this working group as an exchange of ideas, understanding the current limits, where is the current horizon and what are the next questions, the important questions we wanna ask and then finding ways to answer them. So it's really about identifying what's the current questions. Um, so, um, and today I'm really happy. I mean, it's been fun, but there's also some repetition if it's the same person all the time. So it's good. I, I'm really happy to give it over to Yuichi Mori and Daniel von Renton. Uh, so today we're gonna be the co-chairs together and just kind of trying to host through this. Um, Yuichi um, is coming from, from Tokyo, Japan. And I'm not sure what happened, but I think Michael Brettau was like the inspiration for him to come to Oslo, where he's now for the past year working at the University of Oslo and doing good work uh, judged by the publications, uh, primarily in the field of artificial intelligence and clinical implications. And I've known Daniel for many, many years. We share the same mentor, Thomas von Rush, uh, somewhat of the same um, destiny because we both uh, come from Germany and we both uh, moved to 
Northern America. He's in Montreal for the past, I don't know, five, six, seven years, maybe eight years, um, and works there at the University Hospital uh, in Montreal. Um, so Daniel's work uh, has been primarily based related to optical, di a lot, I mean, lots of different things, but one of the things is like optical diagnosis and uh, related to resect and discard strategies. So um, I think I just really want to just take the time and, and move things forward. And um, we have, I think, a wonderful agenda. Uh, I, I wish we could do it like in person, um, as you hopefully all participants who are on this call or on this conference are aware. Um, so um, we're going to start with the topic of artificial intelligence, and then we move over to um, the clinical implications um, uh, related to polyp um, detection and resection, but also then we moving to the larger polyps. And we therefore, what Evelyn already said, we want to expand our focus, not just looking at image enhanced endoscopy, but also at the therapeutic implications, all related to colorectal cancer screening. So uh, with that, I hope I can just introduce the first speaker, Pratik Sharma. Uh, Pratik Sharma is professor at the University of Kansas. Uh, he's actually the, the chair of the ASGE AI task force. So I'm, I'm really happy that he uh, is joining us to uh, share his um, expertise and his uh, ideas and questions related to uh, AI for quality assurance of colonoscopy. Oh, before we get started, Pratik, one more thing about, um, I hope it's going to be, um, uh, a discussion. Now, how can we do this on a virtual space like this? You have the Q&A uh, box where you can type in your answers. And hopefully we're going to go through those talks in a timely manner that we have after each talk, a couple of minutes to respond to those questions and po pose it to, to, to our participants in terms of um, uh, or the speakers in terms of you know discussion and then at the end uh, I hope we have a few more minutes for like verbal contributions and, and uh, I will explain how that works when we get there so if you have a question put it into the Q&A and then we'll try to address it all right Pratik uh, it's your your stage now okay thank you uh, very much Heiko and uh, thanks Evelyn also for that great uh, introduction not just for the program, but for Heiko as well. And again, my congratulations to Heiko for doing such a wonderful job over the years. Uh, so in uh, 10 minutes or less, uh, you know, I'll try to go over AI and quality assurance for colonoscopy. And again, I start off with apologies to several of the experts if I'm not sharing the data because I just want it to be sort of brief about, uh, you know, how to discuss this whole thing in 10 minutes. It's a big topic. I start off with a slide by uh, Michael Kaminsky, again, one of the experts in CRC, and he presented this at UEG uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, th this is how, which I thought was very well done by Michael. And, uh, you know, he used this to say what are our quality measures uh, right now in the different domains and uh, what's the threshold or the metric which has been provided. So right from uh, you know, the Boston Ball prep score or measurement or calculation uh, to sequel intubation rate, uh, you know, to adenoma detection rate, which is identification of pathology. And I'm going to link this in with AI and what are the studies that have looked into this. Uh, management of pathology, this is appropriate polypectomy technique and uh, that will be discussed later on uh, during uh, the course of uh, today. Uh, then when we come to complications, patient experience and post-procedure whether polypectomy surveillance or being appropriately advised or not. So this is the whole gamut of uh, quality in colonoscopy. So uh, Heiko, uh, thank you for allowing me to cover this in 10 minutes or to go over that. So just let's just start off with a few things uh, right off the bat. And so uh, this is uh, one of the uh, studies by a group in uh, Wuhan, China. 
it's always difficult to talk about Wuhan these days, but uh, this actually does make sense. So this is looking, you know, real time at the Boston Ball prep score, and you can see whether the score is zero, one, or two is being provided real time, uh, you know, by the machine as you are doing a withdrawal, uh, you know, during the colonoscopy. Uh, we'd hope our preps are better than the one which is being shown on the screen here, but nonetheless, it's also an example of the Boston Ball prep score. Below on the images, you see the Boston Ball prep score from one, two, three, and four. So what they did is they took uh, a training set of close to 5,000 images and then a smaller set of validation and test images, which are shown here. And their CNN algorithms called the EndoAngel. And again, I'll, I'll be making references to some proprietary softwares, but again, I have no conflicts of interest uh, with any of these uh, companies. So this is that. And so what they found was that the AI in determining the bowel prep was actually uh, much better even when compared to novice investigators, seniors, or to experts, and the numbers are listed there. So uh, this is looking at the bowel prep by artificial intelligence. The second thing is the withdrawal time and recognition of landmarks. And this is uh, of, uh, from Professor Yu that I was able to get this video. On the left is the speedometer, uh, which you know measures uh, the speed of withdrawal. If you're in the green, that's actually a good sign. Uh, you're in the red, that's bad. You're withdrawing too fast. And here's looking at landmarks. So you can see that as the cecum is reached and the appendicillar orifice can be seen on the left-hand side in the cartoon, it's telling you that you've seen the appendicillar orifice and you're examining uh, the cecum. So Cecal intubation rates could be looked at uh, in the future by you know, uh, looking at these different algorithm softwares who will then be able to provide data both in real time as well as cumulative. So you can see that when you've shown the valve, it says that the ileocecal valve has been seen. Now this is the withdrawal that you would do at that time. And uh, you, know, you want to remain somewhere as I mentioned on the left-hand side, if you're withdrawing a little bit too fast, it will go on to the red side. So here it's saying that, yes, you're doing a reasonable job on the withdrawal. If you miss out on the mucosa also, it will go towards the red. So if you're going too close, it says view is lost. Please return to the center of the screen. So you can see that not just for a quality metric, but also maybe for educating our trainees, as well as during some of our educational courses. Uh, these are some very objective measures uh, which can uh, do that. Uh, if you're not reaching the cecum and you're trying to just do a, a reach only up to the ascending colon, it will tell you that the appendicillar orifice, for example, has not been reached and stuff. The second measure is the adenoma detection rate. And so here's, uh, you know, uh, the CAD E devices, which is looking at polyp detection during colonoscopy. And again, I'm just using an example there. There are probably five or six other such, uh, you know, boxes out there which could be used. And again, this is just to start the discussion is that we have different devices to help us uh, with polyp detection during uh, colonoscopy. This is the area where we have the best evidence in the form of randomized control trials. And I'll just share a couple of them. This was the first uh, Asian RCT, again, published from China, uh, comparing high definition white light colonoscopy versus the CAD E device and the CNN names given there. And the input and the outputs are shown there as to how the bounding box comes as an output. And that's based from the input of all the images which are put together. This was the first study to show, at least in an RCT format, that the ADR was significantly higher and the adenomas per colonoscopy or per patient were also significantly higher. Uh, when they looked at large adenomas, the difference was not statistically significant. And this was based on a group or a, a Chinese population. More recently, a European RCT has been uh, conducted using a different device. 
And this looked at screening and surveillance patients, again, randomized patients to either HD colonoscopy without a CADI device versus a CADI device, uh, which is shown here on the screen at the bottom. And they looked at, again, comparing adenoma detection rate and showed a significant improvement in the CADI group as compared to the non-CADI group. Adenomas per patient or APCs uh, were also significantly higher in the CADI group. And in this, the, also there was a significant difference between the large adenomas between uh, the CADI group versus the standard colonoscopy group. This was all put together in a systematic review and meta-analysis of five RCTs that have been uh, you know, published. And this also shows that again, with AI, there is a significant uh, improvement in the ADR. Uh, whereas when it looked for small uh, adenomas, there was no difference between it or the mean APC was no different when they looked at uh, diminutive polyps, at least in this uh, systematic review. So that's one quality metric, ADR, in which there's great evidence uh, for that. One of the challenges is the false positive. So is this going to be more of a distraction in which it will be beeping or uh, you know, the endoscopist is alerted to images or to an area or an ROI, which is incorrect. And this was looked at at close to a thousand false positives, which were identified. And what they found out was that a lot of the false positives were either because of bowel wall issues or bowel con content issues. The majority of it was from the bowel wall, meaning such as a thickened fold, rather than you know, stool in the colon, which also contributed to the false positives, but it was lower. And then they also looked at the time which was spent overlooking a false positive, because what you don't want is you improve one quality metric, which is the ADR, but that's done at a cost of, you know, having a withdrawal time of 20 minutes or a very long uh, procedure time, which may not make it cost effective. And the overall time spent was about 2.4 seconds uh, or, or the rate of false positives per minute were about 2.4 per minute. And the seconds are given on the right in which, you know, on the majority of the ones you spent less than three seconds in evaluating a false uh, positive in that situation. Now, characterization of colon polyps is also done by a number of investigators, including a co-chair Yuichi, who was one of the first to publish that. Uh, which got regulatory approval. And this is just looking at one another device which has looked at that. And this is looking and seeing real-time characterization of polyps so that not only does your CADI device give you a bounding box around a polyp, but it also tells you whether it's an adenoma or not. So can you calculate adenomas in real time rather than the tedious way that you have right now of going back into the endoscopy report, then into the pathology report, and then uh, making all those calculations to do that. And this was done also by Michael Byrne in his initial study, which was looking at it, in which he looked at uh, you know, the NICE classification and the probability of whether it was high probability, lower probability, and what's the confidence of, of that in being uh, you know, a NICE type one versus a type two. And this was done by using their CNN algorithm, which is mentioned there. And in this initial study that they published, uh, again, meeting the PIVI criteria, you can see what their sensitivity, specificity, and more importantly, their negative predictive value is. So we do have good data also on real-time characterization of polyps to do that. So I'll end again with this slide. So if you look at... Uh, you know, the role of AI, where do we stand in uh, quality assurance in colonoscopy? I've shown you data that we have data on automated Boston bowel prep measurement and calculation, which is a quality metric. Uh, sequel intubation assessment can be measured as well, and the calculation can be provided in the studies which I've shown you. Uh, there is improved adenoma detection, characterization, and calculation. Uh, the complete resection assessment and calculation is something that is being worked on right now. There are not very many studies in full publication on that. And of course, the things on the right-hand side are still 
wide open to be assessed by using and assessing the role of artificial intelligence in colonoscopy. So hopefully uh, Heiko and co-chairs have been on time and given you a reasonable assessment of what you asked me to cover. So I'll stop there and thank you all very much for your attention. Pratik, this is uh, great. Um, I'm just realizing it's unbelievable to pack the entire I thing into just a short talk and we can probably just spend a long time uh, on each of the issues. Um, so there's no uh, Q&A. So thank you very much, Pratik. Very great, great summary. Um, Yuichi Daniel, do you have any questions for Pratik? Uh so Pratik, thank you very much for your thorough review on the current status of AI. I was so amazed to see all the slides. Uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, downsides for, from the use of AI, especially focusing on the CAD E or a computer aided detection system for police. Apparently, it will increase the number of adenomas detected during the colonoscopy, which may mean that, that the uh, financial burden will increase. And also, I am a little bit skeptical if the increased ADR means the uh, clinical, cl uh, clinically relevant uh, consequences, because the CADE detect a more number of tiny adenomas, not a large, important advanced adenomas. So, so could you please tell me, tell us about your perspective on these downsides of the new technologies? Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, Yuichi. It's, uh, I, I'm sure you've got the correct answer to it. So I always hesitate talking in front of Yuichi, the expert in AI. So thank you for that. No, so excellent point. I mean, and I think we've struggled with this. This isn't the first time we are struggling with it, right? I mean, when the virtual optical chromoendoscopy techniques came about when uh, you know CT colonography came about. You know, I mean, so whenever we have anything new to image, I think we go back to this discussion: is what's the downside? And I think you absolutely point out the downside. And you know, you can argue about it unrelated to AI as well, right? I mean, if you look at our own ADRs with the advent of high definition endoscopes, we are able to see more than we saw, you know, with the standard definition scopes. And of course, you know, going back to Heiko's days uh, through the optical camera, if you were looking at it, sorry, Heiko, but I mean, if you went there, you know, your ADR is much better already. So you can argue that what's the ceiling? Does it really make sense, uh, you know, to look at all these polyps? And so that's a never ending discussion. So I don't have anything you know, smarter to add to that, but saying that at the end of it, we are all trying to prevent colorectal cancer, right? I mean, that's our goal. Uh, so will this impact, you know, for example, interval, uh, you know, colorectal cancer? Will this reduce PCCRC rates? I mean, those will be the eventual sort of hard outcomes that will show whether not just AI, but any device that we use to improve ADR, whether it's worthwhile or not. Uh, you can argue that, you know, based on the papers from Michael Kaminsky and Doug Corley, we know that ADR correlates with, uh, you know, rates of interval colorectal cancer, right? So you could argue that any improvement is good, but you're right. I mean, if you improve from 55%, if your ADR is already 55, you go up to 60, does it really make any difference for the patient? And the short answer is we just don't know, but I, I think you're right. We have to keep some of the downstream effects of AI in our mind. And since you've mentioned the downstream effects, things like training our fellows, right? I mean, are we going to be too dependent on a caddy device, right? Will we become lazy endoscopists and will we not, you know, stop paying attention to a good withdrawal because uh, we are too dependent on machines and stuff? I don't think so, but again, I mean, those are all, I think also some of the other sort of like, sort of, I wouldn't say bad, but you can say potential bad effects of AI, which may happen. Thank you very much. It's a really important point. Thanks. Thank you. Yuichi, do you wanna move on to the next one in the interest of time? So Pratik, thank you very much for your excellent presentation discussion. I'd like to proceed to the next presenter, who is uh, uh, Dr. Masao Sekiguchi. Uh, he's a Japanese researcher, gastroenterologist, uh, but 
he's currently working at the Karolinska University at the uh, Stockholm. So uh, Masa, could you please start your lecture on uh, how we handle the detection of an increased number of tiny adenomas? Thank you, Yuichi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, thank you, Yuichi, for your kind introduction. I want to thank everyone for giving me a great opportunity. My name is Masao Sekiguchi, uh, belonging to the National Cancer Center Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. I'm currently working at Dandrid Hospital, Korinska Institute, so I'm in Stockholm, Sweden now. My topic, today's topic is how to deal with increasingly detected tiny adenomas. Because diminutive correctal adenomas are increasingly detected, their management is an essential issue. The three options can be mentioned. So the first strategy is the strategy of removing all adenomatous polyp, including diminutive adenomas, and followed by pathological evaluation of all. Actually, this strategy is most widely accepted and recommended. I agree that this strategy is ideal. And second option is the strategy of resect and discard, which I believe later another expert will talk about. And the third strategy is unique strategy, the diagnose and do not resect strategy followed by deferred polypectomy performed when adenomas increase in size. Actually, this strategy is unique and not at all widely accepted worldwide. However, considering increased detection of diminutive adenomas, work burden and cost required for polypectomy and pathological evaluation, and risk of adverse events of polypectomy, increasing number of patients taking multiple antithrombotic drugs, and low malignant potential of diminutive polyps, I believe this strategy is worth consideration and discussion. So uniquely in Japan, this strategy has been allowed for diminutive correctal adenomas size less than five millimeter without any endoscopic findings of advanced histology. Of course, the requirement is high quality colonoscopic diagnosis. However, the problem is the evidence to support this strategy has been insufficient. In this situation, it must be meaningful to examine whether this strategy is acceptable or not based on Japanese unique experience and data. That's the reason why we examined this issue and reported the research in 2019. So let me talk about this, our research today. In this research, we aim to evaluate the cumulative instance of advanced correctal neoplasia in individuals with untreated diminutive adenomas. And also we aim to compare that instance with that in those with no adenomas at baseline. And the database of individuals undergoing screening colonoscopy at the Cancer Screening Center of the National Cancer Center Tokyo, Japan was used. Importantly, all correctal lesions were evaluated during screening colonoscopy using magnifying image enhanced endoscopy as shown in these figures. So in other words, high quality endoscopic diagnosis was provided. And at that study period, actually during the screening colonoscopy, no treatment, including polypectomy, was performed. So when no adenomas or only diminutive non-advanced adenomas, benign non-advanced adenomas size less than five millimeter were detected, follow-up colonoscopy within five years after the initial screening colonoscopy without treatment was recommended and performed. And this slide shows the inclusion criteria for the study participants. There were three conditions. The first condition was asymptomatic individuals undergoing first time screening colonoscopy. And second condition was no adenoma or only diminutive non-advanced adenoma size less than five millimeter detected. And the third condition was at least one follow-up colonoscopy performed after the initial screening colonoscopy without any treatment for correctal polyps. Uh, 
So individuals meeting these, all these three conditions were included. And as a result, study participants included two groups. So group A composed of individuals with untreated diminutive adenomas, and the other group, group B, are composed of individuals with no adenomas at baseline. And the primary outcome measure was the incidence of metachronous advanced correctal neoplasia. And this outcome was also assessed after examining and adjusting four factors associated with the incidence among baseline characteristics. And a total of 1,378 individuals were included and 361 were assigned to group A, individuals with untreated diminutive adenomas, and 1,017 individuals with no adenomas at baseline in group B. The median for a period was just over five years in both groups, and the median number of surveillance chronoscopy was one in both groups. And during the follow-up, a total of 21 advanced correctal neoplasias, including one invasive cancer, were detected. And importantly, the detailed comparison between screening colonoscopy and follow-up colonoscopies indicate that all detected lesions were newly developed in a different location from untreated diminutive adenomas. And this slide showed the cumulative instance of advanced correctal neoplasia in groups A and B. Actually, both groups showed very low cumulative instance of advanced correctal neoplasia. At five years, group A, so those with untreated diminutive adenomas showed only 1.4% incidence, which was not significantly different from group B, 0.8%. Both groups showed very low incidence. And this slide showed the association between baseline characteristics and instance of advanced correctal neoplasia among the factors, only smoking factor. So current smoker was related with higher instance of advanced correctal neoplasia. And after adjusting for smoking status, actually the five-year instance of advanced correctal neoplasia in group A, those with untreated diminutive adenomas has become lower, 1.1%. And regarding characteristics of detected advanced correctal neoplasia, including one invasive cancer, all detected lesions were cured endoscopically. So conclusions are the five-year cumulative instance of advanced correctal neoplasia in those with untreated diminutive adenomas, importantly diagnosed by magnifying image enhanced endoscopy was fairly low. It suggests that the diagnose and do not resect approach may be an acceptable option for diminutive adenomas and importantly, not requiring excessively intensive surveillance. And not only our study, but also several studies from Japan showed the low instance of advanced correctal neoplasia in individuals with untreated diminutive adenomas diagnosed by magnifying image enhanced endoscopy. So finally, let me summarize my talk. So regarding management of diminutive correctal adenomas, of course, I agree that the first option, removing all adenomatous polyps followed by pathological evaluation is ideal. But at the same time, I believe that based on the obtained findings from our research and several other researches from Japan, I think that that strategy of diagnose and do not resect strategy may be an, a potential alternative if diagnosed by high quality endoscopy, particularly in a special occasion, for example, for patient taking multiple antithrombotic drugs or very elderly patients. And also, we believe that the obtained findings from our research can be informative when considering a lot of colorectal cancer screening issues. So thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Masav, for an excellent presentation. I think his research is very unique, especially to Western endoscopists. Uh, this is because uh, Japanese guideline is really unique, which allows the living adenomas in situ. Uh, given we, we can provide some 
uh, specific surveillance endoscopies. So, uh, Daniel or Heiko, do you have any comments or perspective on his presentation? Yeah, um, congratulations on this fantastic study and presentation. I find it absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What you what you presented, and and also like. I mean, I, I guess we, we all wonder when we remove these diminutive polyps and adenoma, am I really preventing a cancer? And now our detection rate is going up and, and so, and, and how you pointed out brilliantly, maybe it's more important to convince the patient to stop smoking than to remove the you know, tiny adenoma. Um, my question to you is, so if, if we go with your strategy and we say, okay, let's leave them in, even if we, if we optical diagnosis, it's an adenoma three millimeter, but now we're also moving to longer surveillance interval, 10 years, maybe we move to longer, even once in a lifetime colonoscopy. With what do you feel comfortable as a surveillance interval if you say I leave a four or five millimeter adenoma in there, is 10 years okay? Or, or where is your cutoff or once in a lifetime? Is that, you know, how do you? Yeah, thanks for a very important question. Actually, so surveillance interval is a really important issue. So if we can say we can leave the tiny adenomas, but if we have to say so strict surveillance is required, it sounds a bit ridiculous. So that's a really important issue. And of course, based on our research and other, other researches from Japan, still the so median follow-up period is just over five years. So I cannot comment on the validity of 10 year interval. However, at least five years, because uh, based on obtained findings from our research, so the cumulative instance of advanced colorectal neoplasia at five years is really low, 1.4%. So I think that five year interval may be acceptable, of course, our research study participants, um, almost the number of untreated diminutive adenomas were low, so less than three. So I cannot comment on those with a lot of untreated diminutive adenomas. However, the number is limited and endoscopic diagnosis quality is high. In that case, at least I can say that five-year interval can be acceptable. This is, uh, uh, Masao, thank you. This is uh, a much, in my opinion, a much under discussed um, issue. Um, and I wonder whether we should in general try to take a broader uh, perspective on that uh, problem or we can try to phrase that problem. Perhaps the problem is, let's say 60 to 70% of people who undergo screening have a diminutive adenoma. So the prevalence of adenomas, diminutive adenomas or a adenoma is very high. In that sense, um, this does not really represent the high risk group for cancer. So maybe we should take a step back and say, all right, this is not, we're not going to define patients by adenoma presence, but by difference. Now, recent guidelines have changed that, but one possibility would be, the question is how can we prove that in practice? Because currently we are coming from the conservative approach, everything has mm -hmm. to come out. So one possibility is we, we just go back to the true cancer screening test, which is fit for a fecal based testing mm -hmm. or one of those. Um, and, and then when we do a colonoscopy and we don't find a significant lesion, which might be larger than a diminutive one, we just go back to fit. That's just a question. For instance, the study could look like uh, fit positive. We do colonoscopy, we take those out that are larger, like a centimeter or larger. And for everything less, we just have go back to fit screening. Those that were, had some polyps every two years or I don't know, after three years or whatever. And then if there's a fit positive, we go back in. Um, so I'm just curious, I think in the West, uh, we would need to convince patients, uh, doctors, uh, policymakers from the benign approach of that. And that has to be some kind of natural history study combined with some kind of security. Anyway, so I'm, I'm really curious if people have a great idea about like how to set up a study like this. Uh, we've, Daniel and I, I know we've been talking about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it's kind of a little bit heretic to think that. Uh, I'm, oh, Rocky Schoen is there. Hi, Rocky. So a nice presentation. The AI data suggests that many people have adenomas that are not detected and are not resected. So really this strategy is probably occurring commonly 
it really comes down to long-term cancer risk. How are we going to figure out what ADR is good enough? Yeah, that's that's. Anybody wants to say something about this? Thank you, Rocky, for your comment. Um, yeah. Um, another comment is nice presentation. One quality downside is the negative effect on ADR in patients with isolated diminutive adenomas. Yep. So I think one of the, the gist of those comments is that it's happening or has happened already. You know, lots of people are you know, leaving colonoscopy without having been found diminutive adenomas and long-term follow-up studies on those lower risk patients show that it's as as low as a risk of having no adenomas in some ways. Um, but I think it's going to be an active field for the future. And then hopefully we're going to have some kind of study approach too to mm -hmm. put some substance to it. I wish we had more time, um, but we're already seven minutes behind schedule. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to give it over to Daniel. Uh, as I said before, he's been working on a resecting this card and this topic is related to what Masao was just talking about. So um, Daniel, um, take it away with, is the idea of resecting this card still relevant? Thank you very much, Heiko. Um, yes, I have the have the pleasure to present this this uh, fascinating um, topic. If resect and discard is still relevant, and thank you very much for the invitation to present this. And the the short answer is yes. I think it's it's more relevant than ever, um, especially since we have um, CAT E. We have increasing. Um, adenoma and polyp detection rate. And I just wanted to put out this one uh, recent meta-analysis looking at, at the effect of artificial intelligence and, and CAD-E. And we see the same what we see with other new modalities, high definition, um, better technical developments like endocarf or um, techniques like water immersion our adenoma detection rate is, is going up. And that means also our detection rate for diminutive and small polyps and adenoma is, is, uh, is going up. And also our detection rate um, for hyperplastic polyps. So, um, and, and I believe our, our ADR benchmarks and expectations will continue to go up. Um, which will, we will find all these innocent bystanders that, that likely don't contribute to cancer um, development if we use these modern techniques. And um, I also think in the, in the context that many screening programs move to fit testing initially before colonoscopy, um, our, our polyp detection rates, adenoma detection rates, and the detection of these diminutive and, and likely non-significant um, lesions will continue to go up. And it's quite time consuming um, um, to, to really remove every one of these, um, put them in a separate pathology uh, jar, follow them all up, and then make a decision of the surveillance interval. So I think it's gonna become more pressing to have a solution like resect and um, discard to deal with that. And I just wanted to, to, to put out this slide. Yes, the, the majority is really um, is uh, small and diminutive polyps that we detect. Um, most of them are non-advanced adenomas and the, the risk for cancer is really exceedingly um, rare. So, so our routine practice to remove them all, send them all for pathology has its problems with cost, with the need for follow-up. Then um, we have a couple of weeks later, we have to check the pathology report and then to make a decision on the follow-up interval based on pathology and then to communicate that with the referring um, physician. So I think resect and discard is, is really a, a way how to deal with all these small lesions. And as my, um, uh, the co-presenters already presented, like the resect and discard or diagnose and leave strategy are available um, for us. That was based in the past on doing an optical diagnosis with NBI or eye scan or any um, chromoendoscopy system available. And it was challenging because the, um, the surveillance interval agreement that was proposed as benchmark was often not reached outside of the academic setting. There is, there needs to be credentialing and monitoring of the quality of optical diagnosis, documentation, 
needs, we need to choose the right polyclassification system, and there is just some complexity um, that we, we need to have a high confidence diagnosis, and then um, if we don't, we need to still send one polyp to pathology, the other not. Um, and we did a recent survey and asked endoscopists, are you using this strategy or not, and, and what are your your concerns about it. And, and the, the response was clearly like endoscopists right now are not using optical diagnosis or um, resect and discard in their practice. And they're afraid of making a wrong optical diagnosis, assigning wrong surveillance interval and also medical legal concerns. So I think now um, the three solutions or solutions that are available to really overcome these problems we had with optical diagnosis is A, is the artificial intelligence-based optical diagnosis, which helps to um, increase the optical diagnosis skills of, of low performers and, and kind of even out the different skills and also transfer kind of the res responsibility for the diagnosis to this AI software, to this CATX um, program, instead of having the endoscopist making a choice and, and you know, being potentially responsible for an incorrect optical diagnosis. And then we were testing out different strategies. Maybe there's also a way to, to just get away from optical diagnosis at all. And we, we tested a few strategies that I want to present on location-based and polyp-based uh, resect and discard strategies, which eliminate the need to, to use um, any form of optical diagnosis. And then the, the latest series we did um, is to look, where should we put the, the cutoff level for um, resect and discard? It's kind of right now agreed we use it for diminutive polyps, and then there are some studies expanding it to 10 millimeter polyps, but maybe there's different ways and, and different cutoff levels that would be beneficial in some form. And I think the the first solution um, everybody knows is, is artificial intelligence, which is extremely exciting. And um, we, we see that these, these softwares are extremely capable of, of uh, making a decision what kind of polyp it is and giving a, a very high accuracy for optical um, diagnosis and determining hyperplastic from adenomatous um, lesions. And I think if for anyone uh, who has the availability of such a system, that's, that's definitely um, uh, a good choice to, to start implementing optical polyp diagnosis, especially in the context that we find all these small ones. And I now see, I mean, what do we do with all these tiny rectosigmoid um, um, polyps that we are detecting and that also cut E and, and the artificial intelligence modules help us to identify um, better. So, so there, I think this is, um, this is one solution, but also not available to, to everyone, also not available in the, in the next year. So that will take some time to really make its way into our practice. And then um, as an alternative, we looked into this um, location-based, we called it location-based resect and discard strategy. We know that rectosigmoid um, polyps have a tendency to be more often hyperplastic and, and the proximals are more likely neoplastic. And we just said, okay, what if we just declare every diminutive um, polyp we find in the, in the um, right-sided colon as a neoplastic one, as a low-risk adenoma, and we declare every um, rectosigmoid one as a hyperplastic one, and then use that to assign the surveillance interval and compare that to optical diagnosis and also the pathology-based result. And we find an extremely high um, uh, rate of surveillance interval agreement, especially with the um, 2020 US FMT um, guidelines because most of these polyps are followed up at 10 year anyway, according to the guidelines. So if I have a low risk adenoma or hyperplastic and I only have like a maximum of two adenomas, um, I can, and a 10 year surveillance interval is, is, is okay. So, so even if, if my accuracy for the individual diagnosis is not that great, um, we end up at, a, at, a, at the right surveillance interval anyway. And we tested that with the 2012 guidelines. It's not as good, but with the 2020 guidelines, we have this extremely high um, um, agreement with the, with the guideline-conformed surveillance interval. 
Um, and we, we checked it uh, against uh, optical diagnosis. And interestingly, this, this location-based has a, has a higher surveillance interval agreement than optical um, diagnosis. And we also see that it really reduces um, the amount of pathology exams needed, and it increases by far the amount of patients for which we can say on the day of colonoscopy, okay, um, we can tell you when to come back and we don't have to follow up patho pathology reports and communicate um, the pathology results. And that shows a little bit the, the trajectory. So you have here on the, on the left side, the standard approach, all pathology is taken out. Um, and then you see if you do take the location based, you reduce by 70% the need of pathology exams. And this is the different optical diagnosis approaches we reduce. So the, the um, um, location based outperform start and also the immediate surveillance interval is essentially available for um, patients that um, uh, that have a normal colonoscopy and it's it's almost doubled with the location-based strategy and a bit higher than the um, than the optical diagnosis. So another alternative we used is just to say, okay, if I have a certain combination of, of polyp numbers and size, can I already predict um, the, the next surveillance interval? We called it polyp-based resect and discard strategy, made this table to assign um, the, the next surveillance interval. And we find also here, if we use such a strategy, we get an above 90% um, percent surveillance interval agreement. It's pretty much um, similar to the optical um, uh, diagnosis strategy. And interestingly, we gave this, this uh, sheet to assign surveillance interval the to the endoscopist in the room. If the endoscopist uses it, they, they deviate a bit more from using it as intended. So, and then they, there are differences in the assigned surveillance interval based on endoscopist um, decision. And maybe there are other factors they know about the patient history of a large adenoma or so in the previous colonoscopy, which makes them deviate. But um, if it is used as intended, we get the 90% um, surveillance interval agreement. And this just to, to sh briefly mention, um, is the optical diagnosis. So we got above 90% surveillance interval agreement. Then this poly-based used as intended, also 90% used by the endoscopist, about 75%. And then we checked it again with the newer guidelines because this was a prospective study. And if we use the um, 2020 guidelines, we get um, a 97, 98% um, agreement. And we see again that the need for pathology um, exams is drastically reduced with optical diagnosis and even more with these polyp-based stra strategies. Um, and that we can send many more patients home on the same day with um, the recommendation when to come back. So there are other ways if um, to assign surveillance intervals. There are also other ways given that most of these polyps are not really dangerous to, to um, maybe do resect and discard without needing, um, without needing optical diagnosis. And another question we were evaluating is, should there be a smaller cutoff level? Um, we know the best predictor for advanced pathology is, is the polyp size. Um, and um, knowing that right now there is no resect and discard strategy, which basically can filter out high-grade dysplastic lesions or distinguish between a sessile lesion subentity, the idea was what if we cut down the, um, the polyp size to, a, to um, a smaller size, do we filter out this risk for inappropriate management of um, these advanced lesions? And we have a larger database that we use together with, with HICO's um, center and typical screening surveillance um, colonoscopies. And we found also here the, the, the vast majority of polyps are diminutive and small polyps. And if we reduce to one to three centimeter, the, the risk for a, a delayed two or seven year delay um, uh, of surveillance interval using a resect and discard strategy is drastically um, reduced in this, this cohort. So I think that's an, another interesting avenue 
which is um, also important in the context of using artificial intelligence, because as long as artificial intelligence cannot distinguish um, between a high grade and a low grade um, ad um, dysplastic adenoma, um, we still have the same, the same problem that could be addressed by, by polyp size. And looking at the surveillance interval agreement, we see that the surveillance interval agreement, when we limit the polyp size to a smaller size, it gets a little bit um, better compared to an increasing um, um, polyp size. But um, of course, if we include five millimeter and 10 millimeter polyp into the resect and discard strategy, um, we will have we will avoid more um, pathology exams and we can send more patient home with uh, um, telling them the next surveillance interval. Um, so we're just, just putting together um, this data and we still find we could, by limiting to one to three millimeter um, uh, size, the resect and discard strategy, we could eliminate the need for 30% of, of pathology exams that we right now have, and we almost never encounter advanced neoplasia that will be then um, put into a wrong surveillance interval. And I find this is one of the recent papers that I found very interesting. The other question is how reliable is our pathology result for the one to three millimeter polyps? And, and Doug Rex has published a few studies recently showing there are these polyps that clearly look adenomatous and the endoscopist says so and the artificial intelligence algorithm says so, but the, the pathology report comes back as normal colon mucosa as a mucosal fold. And, and um, so is the, the specimen often destroyed when, when we do it with a forceps resection or so? And, and, and can, how, how well can we trust the pathology as a reference standard for one to three millimeter polyps anyway? And if we can not um, trust that, um, shouldn't we do then resect and discard anyway? So I think um, just as a conclusion, it, it, it is, for me, it's, it's the time that we find a way to really implement resect and discard into our um, practice, either by having an, an AI-assisted optical diagnosis or by other non-optical approaches or by saying, okay, let's start safe and we limit the polyp size. But I also think we need the society endorsement and we need kind of a, a medical legal framework for endoscopists so that we're really able to to start doing that thank you daniel this is an interesting topic because you know in a way it's something like um uh the parallel path without ai so we won't we wouldn't need ai if you just use a location based a polyp uh, based uh, approach that would be an alternative and we would still fulfill the PV criteria for resect and discard depending on the size cutoff of course too so that's kind of interesting uh, of course we we don't AI is going to be a reality it's going to be integrated in the system so it's going to be part of it um, so um, what's left to do I mean other than societal endorsements which they have in to some ways but what's really what's the unanswered questions before we can really uh, practice it can, can we already do it what's the situation or is it just a medical legal issue well personally I think we, we should design some some study that really uses it in real life like now we always do we take them out, we send them to pathology and, and you know, and, and then we, we look, oh, what, what would have happened if I would have used um, um, uh, uh, resect and discard? I think the next step would really to be, okay, let's do a resect and discard study. Of course, it's the comparator is missing then, but, but just to look at safety, you know, in, this, in way. Yeah, would this be like, a, it could be a randomized study. You yeah. could just say, okay, in this, uh, based on randomization, this patient is gonna follow the standard and the other one is following this resect and discard. And of course we have the gold standard that we currently use at the end of it. I'm not sure whether we really, we kind of know what we're gonna get because we already kind of have the results. So mm -hmm. Yuichi, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, but I think we should pick up that Q&A first, uh, sorry. Uh, Evelyn Decker has some question. Oh, good. Yes. Yep. 
how good should an AI optical diagnosis system be to be accepted for daily practice for reject and discard? Sanyu? Um, it, it's a good question because the, the AI system accuracy is extremely high and, and the, these other location-based and poly-based, our accuracy to assign the, um, the right pathology is of course not, not good. But in the end, it doesn't matter because almost all polyps end up um, at a 10-year at a interval. As long and then you have the one in a thousand high-grade dysplastic where you miss a sign. Uh, but um, um, we, we looked at this with, with Heiko and, and we found that in 75% of, of cases, an incorrect um, diagnosis, optical diagnosis for diminutive polyp has no, no relevance for assigning the, the um, surveillance interval. So as long as they are completely resected, most of the time, it, like the accuracy is, is not that important actually. Yeah, I, I agree with your idea. It's really important topic to be addressed. But uh, uh, Heiko, maybe we should proceed to the next presenter. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately the time is running. So um, the next the next presenter is we're going to move from the diminutive ones to the big ones, the ones that really matter. And I welcome Kim Giesbers, who's going to who's working with um, Leon Moons, and Leon Moons is uh, the chair of the national T1. Uh, 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 studying group on T1 cancers in the Netherlands, and and he's also the um, endoscopy director at the Utrecht Medical Center. And Kim Gispers has been working with him, and she's going to present the topic on um, how it should be assessed incomplete. Uh, no, uh, wait and see strategy as an alternative to complete surgery for T1 cancers in a subset of patients. All right, Kim. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, show our results here. So um, I'm going to tell you about the surveillance strategy as an alternative to completion uh, surgery for high-risk T1 cancers. So um, all guidelines at this moment advise uh, to consider completion surgery in case of a high-risk T1 colorectal carcinoma. And high risk is generally um, defined as uh, the presence of one of the one or more of these um, pathological uh, risk factors. Um, however, uh, on the contrary, we have the risks of completion surgery with an overall mortality of about 1.7%, uh, which depends on age, comorbidities, sex, and type of operation, as you can see. Uh, in these tables in which the percentage of severe complications is displayed. And besides, in about 2 to 4% of the patients, disease recurrence uh, could not be prevented with the completion surgery. And then, of course, you have the morbidity um, as a consequence of these uh, operations. So uh, what we like to oppose is intensive follow-up and solve surgery as an alternative strategy. So um, strategy A is the way we do it right at this moment. And then uh, strategy B is the intensive follow-up. Um, and so after endoscopic resection, patients uh, will have uh, uh, surveillance. And then in case an if, um, recurrence um, is detected, salvage surgery uh, can be performed in about 60% of patients in a cur curative stage, and that's found in a recent um, meta-analysis. So um, if we approach this in a theoretical way, then on uh, the one side we have the surveillance uh, strategy, uh, with the axis here, the risk of lymph node metastasis as baseline, and then uh, the mortality of the recurrence, which is about 40%. And then you get the green line. And on the other side, you have the surgical approach with immediate completion surgery after endoscopic resection. And then you have the risk of surgical mortality of about 1.7% and the risk of recurrence of about 2.5%. And then you have, you see that like the benefit of surgery will be from about 10, 10% um, um, risk of lymph node metastasis. So, our question was, what is the optimal threshold for performing completion surgery in high-risk T1 uh, colorectal cancers? 
And our main outcome was metastasis-free survival, uh, which was a composite of CRC-related death and uh, recurrence outside the surgical fields. And um, so to do that, we made a linear prediction model for lymph node metastasis in the surgical group. And uh, we used for this the same uh, variables as the recent study by Kudo et al. And uh, we used that model to calculate the risk of lymph node metastasis in our surveillance group and um, plotted this against the predicted three years metastasis free survival, which was calculated by a Cox proportional hazards model. And we did it with our retrospective uh, database uh, with all consecutive patients with a T1 colorectal cancer between 2000 and 2017 in 20 Dutch hospitals, and uh, which has um, over three and a half thousand patients at the moment. And then we uh, uh, excluded patients with a primary surgical resection, patients with a low risk um, endoscopic resection and patients with baseline distant metastasis. So we could finally include um, nearly 1,200 patients. And of these 1,200 patients, over 500 patients had a surveillance strategy after endoscopic resection of a high-risk T1 colorectal cancer, and 651 patients had completion surgery. And what we saw is that uh, the surveillance group um, is significantly older with more comorbidities according to the ASA classification. And both groups have about two and a half to three years of surveillance. Um, and then if we take a look at the um, pathological um, baseline characteristics, we see that the surgical group has um, more lymphovascular invasion. And in the total group of patients with completion surgery, 10.8% lymph node metastasis was detected. So um, as a consequence of the higher um, age and uh, more comorbidities in the surveillance group, we saw that the overall survival was lower in this group. However, um, the metastasis-free survival was equal in both groups in the total cohort. Um, and also the number of distant metastasis was um, uh, equally in these groups. So uh, if we then take a look at the relation of the metastasis-free survival to the predicted lymph node metastasis in both groups, um, then you see here the uh, black line is the surgical group and um, the red line is the surveillance group. And you see that the turning point for benefit of completion surgery is at about the 10% like we found in our theoretical approach. But if um, the, this line uh, can move uh, up in patients with a uh, younger age and less comorbidity, so then you see that it's about six or 7% and uh, uh, line goes down in older patients with a higher ASA classification, and then it's even like 12 or 13 percent. So um, we think there is a window for more surveillance and less surgery in these patients, especially for this intermediate risk group. Uh, but the main question is, um, which situations belong in this intermediate risk group. Um, like for instance, patients with a solitary risk factor, um, but a good uh, prediction model at this moment is lacking, but it's definitely a tool for shared decision-making with the patient. Um, uh, a few limitations of this study should be acknowledged. Um, at first, the retrospective design, um, which can, uh, make there is confounding by indication and competing mortality and uh, the quality of follow-up is limited uh, as there's not a, a standard protocol for these patients and uh, at this moment these patients were uh, treated tumor budding was not encountered yet so um, prospective research is definitely needed 
And uh, recently in the Netherlands, we've started a prospective reg registry of intensive follow-up after a radical resection of T1 colorectal carcinoma with one risk feature. And in this table, you see the risk of lymph node metastasis according to the literature for these risk uh, factors. And we already have a prediction model for the pedunculated T1s. Um, and we have composed this uh, follow-up protocol for patients with a colonic um, T1 carcinoma. Um, but we'd like to hear uh, what you think about it. And uh, we think that this is a good window for uh, international cooperation on one side for this prospective registry and on the other side to um, compose a large cohort of patients in which we can make good uh, prediction models. So um, thank you for your attention and uh, we'd like to hear your opinion on this uh, topic. Kim, this was a very interesting uh, uh, contribution and um, uh, I just um, looking at the questions, there are no active questions here. I think, Yuichi, Daniel, do you, any thoughts when you hear the proposal of surveilling the T1 cancer patients, even if there is a risk factor present? Yeah, uh, thanks, Heiko. And I thank you very much, Kim, for your brilliant uh, presentation. Actually, I, I, I was involved in the similar research in Japan, so I have some comments on your research. I think if you want to uh, make uh, some prediction model, uh, it is really important to uh, to uh, make a decision based on a very objective uh, perspective on a pathological assessment. I think there are a lot of the inter in, inter observer variance uh, among the pathologists in terms of the presence of lymphovascular invasion or depth of the invasion or even the uh, classification of the uh, uh, of the cancer uh, grade. So. Uh, do you have any idea to overcome this subjective uh, diagnosis taken in, in happening in the pathological field? Um, uh, yes, that, that, that is, of course, uh, it remains uh, one of the problems to overcome. And um, like uh, the, we did not only um, take the uh, pathology uh, pathological uh, risk factors in the risk model, but also age and uh, tumor location, tumor size, um, and um, uh, the morphology were uh, taken into account to predict the risk of lymph node metastasis. So to do it both ways. Well, that's going to be really nice to pick up just the objective variables to make a prediction model. May, may I comment also? I think that the 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 histology problem is, I think, a contemporary problem. We we've seen that we, we are now conducting a, a multinational pathology expert panel looking at T1 colorectal cancers, and you can see even if you bring experts together, they start discussing uh, well, is this uh, lymphovascular invasion or not, and is it one cell or two cells, and and I think that even among experts, there's there's a real high variability in how you score that. So um, I think that, that that's really a problem. But for example, if you look at the um, the 50 percent of the high risk cases, or, or more or less, maybe 30 or 40, but um, of the high risk cases are supposed to be depth of invasion. But we performed a recently a meta analysis together with the uh, with Evelyn Decker, and we showed that the um, the actual risk of of recurrence on lymph node metastasis within deep invasion is about two to three percent. So you can start debating whether whether this group is really uh, benefiting from uh, completion surgery if there are some other risk factors for surgery, for example, age or, uh, or comorbidity. And I think if, even in younger patients, I think to do an APR or a, or a distal rectal uh, resection for a two to 3% risk, I think is, is discussable. Thanks for your comment. It's really important topic to be discussed. I, I think we have some question from the audience. No. Uh, Heiko, Daniel, do you have any comments? Oh, 
Okay, so I have another question. I had a question, but it's okay. All right, yeah, please. No, I, the, it, one, one thing I want to really pick up the idea of uh, using this as a platform to, uh, you know, invite interested people to contact you um, if they want to participate in this. That's how I understand it. Uh, the main question I have in terms of the research is, um, as you said, confounding or selection bias, which is people who are in the surveillance group are sicker. Uh, they might die before the recurrence might happen because of their comorbidities. And it's hard to apply the results to the general person who has like an incomplete or like has a higher risk lesion and say, here, look, we had a good outcome with this other group, but you cannot really generalize that. So I think the idea is great. Uh, the risk prediction model, uh, of course, is not, you know, we don't really have it, but but we know about some of the risks in terms of lymph node metastasis. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how that progresses, Leon and Kim. Yuji. Yeah, uh, Leon, can I ask one question? Uh, I, I want to hear your perspective on the new study design in which uh, researchers use the pathological image or digital pathological image, and based on the analysis, they can predict the prognosis of the corrected cancer. Uh, this was published just in Lancet, Lancet last year. Yes, I think this is really an objective manner to assess the risk of the T1 cancer as well. What do you think? Well, at the moment, the, the our uh, large set of our slides are uh, being sent to Oslo <laughs> to uh, yeah, that's to look at them. Uh, um, as you know, and the problem is then that that there are some prediction models eh, um, on more advanced colorectal cancers like uh, the SFCMS score eh, and also the uh, immuno score. And unfortunately, man many of these models do not apply to T1 colorectal cancers. So. Um, I don't know for certain whether, um, which you can pick up or signals you can pick up in more advanced colorectal cancers, do really predict the, the, the presence of lymph node metastasis as well as do they in, uh, in T1 colorectal cancers. But if they did, it would be an extreme, uh, extreme step forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's really you know, interesting new research field, I guess. Thanks. May, I may, I may make a last remark. I think you have the need to go forward, but I think it's very important that we multi-continental uh, make very large uh, collection of, of real patient data to make a model on about maybe 10,000 or 15,000 of T1 colorectal cancers to make a good prediction model because the problem is that it is mostly not reduced it is more uh, on, on one country and there are so many differences and should, we should overcome that um, to make a more robust model so we can go into our clinic and say to the patient, not that you're at high risk, but you say you have this is your risk. Leon, you are you it. are you setting up a registry of some sort that people can contribute? I will. Uh, if everybody starts contacting me, I will start contacting everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, in the interest of time, I think we have to move on. Um, we might just uh, stay together for a couple of minutes after the time's up, the 1.30 time. But um, I really want to give also Nick Burgess the chance to talk about how should we assess incomplete resection and how can we prevent post-polbectomy recurrences after polyp resection. So, so Nick is uh, staying awake in, in Sydney, I believe, where I think it's past two o'clock or so. Um, or even yeah, it's, three. It's nearly half past three now. So, all right. So, uh, thank my you. My core Nick, temperature for... has dropped very low. So, <laughs> uh, apologies if I'm a bit slow. Yeah, that's all right. All right, Nick. Uh, just to tell us about incomplete resection and how we can improve it. Yeah. Th thanks, Heiko, and uh, thanks to the um, WEO for the invitation to talk. Um, so, I'm going to talk about incomplete resection and post polypectomy recurrence, and how we can potentially improve this. Uh, so I'll just go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about why it occurs, why it may occur, how we might measure it, and how, how we can make things better. And I'm going to focus on um, the sort of research that I do, which is around larger size polyps over 20 millimeters in size. There's a lot of data around polyps that are under 20 millimeters in size. Um, but I wanted to speak about these higher risk lesions and the things that we can improve there. So the first thing is, why do we get incomplete resection? Is it an adequate technique? We all know that when we're resecting things that you can have difficulty with folds, colon motility, the actual location of the lesion, and those can all impair your ability to resect it. Um, is it something about how careful people are or fastidious they are, what training they've had? 
or are we choosing the wrong technique? So we, um, for smaller polyps, for example, using biopsy forceps where we should be using snares. For larger polyps, are we choosing um, EMR when we should be choosing ESD? Um, and then are we inspecting afterwards, after the resection is performed, to ensure that the, the lesion is completely gone? So once again, folds, colon motility affect that. Um, but also um, bleeding related to the resection, thermal artifact, mucosal edema can impair our ability to decide whether or not we've completely removed the lesion. And then is it possible that we, we can't actually see some of these um, incompletely resected areas? Are they so small that they're not visible? Um, and are they occurring in the margins or in the defects? So there's lots of questions about why we're getting incomplete resection. And then how do we measure it? So the first way of um, measuring incomplete resection is, is, is looking at the, um, the resection defect and inspecting, but that's prone to bias. And also endoscopists may think they've resected everything, but we know that um, from, the, from the Heiko and Daniel's care study that you, know, the, that you get, that you get uh, residual, even if you think that you've completely resected. So we may be missing things there. Um, another thing is that uh, we, can, we can sample the margins. So we can take biopsies at the, at the uh, margins of the defect, or we can get the histopathologist to look at the resected specimen and decide whether or not um, there's residual that's there. Um, but, but both of these have got some flaws. For biopsies, there's a sampling error. And if you're looking at the resected specimen, then the histopathologist may find it difficult or impossible to make that assessment, and it may be affected by processing artifact. I looked very hard to see if I could find um, uh, studies where incomplete resection was subsequently matched to recurrence down the line. Because one of the things you want to say is if you've incompletely resected something, you, you would assume that the lesion would recur later. Um, but I could only find a couple of studies. There may be people in the audience who know of other studies like this, but this was one of them. Um, many, uh, a retrospective study, multiple different uh, or, uh, advanced adenomas. And the, um, the, there were th around 354 out of 2,233 uh, 2, lesions that were incompletely resected, um, about 15.6%. Um, and however, when they looked at the recurrence rate down the track, only 19% of those had recurrent lesions. So not everyone that had an incomplete resection seemed to recur. And similarly for this study, which is also a small retrospective um, study, um, the recurrence uh, with margin unclear or margin positive cases was uh, zero in follow up to three years. So what we, want, what we don't know is whether or not incomplete resection um, actually correlates to true recurrence down the line. And that's something I think that needs to be explored um, in the future. Um, when we're looking at larger polyps, recurrence uh, is something that is the, the, almost the gold standard, um, but it does require follow-up. If you're looking at recurrence for smaller lesions, so if you're removing lesions under 20 millimeters in size, you may not be able to find the scar and you might miss a, a, a recurrence. So it's, it's, it's a more difficult measure to use for smaller polyps. Um, but for larger polyps, it's more reliable. And can all scars be detected um, is one of the questions that's raised there. Um, but um, at Westmead, we've done a study where we've looked at um, the recurrence uh, or the scars and determined whether or not they are actually visible um, with or without tattoo placement. So this is a study that's um, uh, just recently been published. We looked at the uh, A-study lesions from 2008 to 2019. Um, about, oh, about 112 uh, uh, lesions uh, had, uh, sorry, 124 lesions um, had a tattoo prior to the resection, um, and uh, 1,000 lesions didn't have a tattoo. And at the surveillance colonoscopy, we looked at whether or not we could actually see the scar using a standardized protocol. And the upshot was that, um, yes, you can. Uh, it's, it even, so with a tattoo, it's 100%, you can find the scar. Without a tattoo, 99.7%, you can, you can find a scar. And that was um, applicable across all types of lesions. So you can find the scars, detection is reliable of these. And so looking for recurrence is the best way of um, determining whether or not um, you've incompletely resected the lesion to start with. Um, I guess the gold standard is, is post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer. That's the, uh, the outcome we're all looking at and trying to prevent. 
Um, but this is very difficult to measure as, a, as an outcome for incomplete resection. It occurs infrequently. It requires retrospective review um, and uh, sort of requires circumstantial evidence and that the lesion has to be from a similar location. Um, so it's not really a, um, a useful measure. So probably the best thing to look at is recurrence. And so the aim here is to try and reduce recurrence. Um, I've looked particularly at um, EMR, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, we know that EMR is, um, is very good, but recurrence is an issue. So in a meta-analysis from um, 2016, we saw that uh, recurrence was about 13, occurred in about 13.8% across studies. Um, and it, and it may be, it's been shown to be more than that in many other studies. Um, and what are the ways that we can look at trying to reduce recurrence? Um, can we improve EMR competency? Can we train people better? Can we do directly observed um, polypectomy um, uh, uh, studies, um, refer cases to experts or use alternative techniques such as ESD or maybe underwater EMR? All those are, are options. One of the things that we've recently shown is very effective is margin ablation. And this is also recommended in the US um, guidelines now. So um, we basically want to make sure that when you perform EMR or resection of a polyp, that you completely remove the lesion by snare resection um, and that you have no re visible residual. So we want to avoid this adjunctive um, uh, thermal techniques to try and remove tissue. And we want to use adjuvant techniques. So once we've re completely removed everything, there's nothing left. Um, we then use an adjuvant thermal technique to try and treat the margins to prevent recurrence. And this is uh, what we use, snare tip soft coagulation at the margins of the lesion, uh, usually 80 watts effect for um, on the Irby settings, uh, with the snare tip slightly protruded, and then you work around the edges of the, um, of the defect. And we showed this is remarkably effective at um, reducing recurrence. So this is the SCAR study that we published in 2019, a fourfold reduction in endoscopic and histological re recurrence. Um, getting down to recurrence rates of around 5% or so. And this is even more marked in lesions over 40 millimeters in size where the real risk of recurrence occurs. Um, so we're seeing quite uh, marked drops there. We've subsequently examined that in, um, in uh, clinical practice. So I looked at the clinical effectiveness of this in five tertiary centers, including one international center. Um, and uh, once again, have shown that this is, right, this is very effective. In this cohort, you can see the blue box in the middle is the total cohort altogether. altogether. Overall recurrence was actually just 3%. Um, when you use a, um, a, a thermal ablation technique at the margins, and if you look at just the ones that had complete margin ablation, the recurrence was 1.4%. So that's in the box in green on, uh, on the left-hand side. If, if the thermal ablation was incomplete, recurrence was up around 27% mark. So those were larger lesions where it was more difficult to treat them or impossible. Um, so it's really quite an effective technique. Um, it does have to be learned in a practice, but it's very simple to learn um, and make sure that you can apply. Um, so one of the other things that I think every talk now deserves um, a section on is, is AI. So this is one of the other things that you can, that may be potentially used um, can, can we use AI in the future to detect and complete resection? Can we look at margins? Um, can we, um, uh, to, to see whether or not there's a residual that's not being picked up um, by mere humans? Um, the, the pitfalls with this are gonna be obviously, once again, folds, colon motility, location, et cetera, and all the other things, the bleeding thermal artifact and mucosal edema, which are gonna impair our ability to see those things. And then the other thing is that can AI be used to detect scars and detect recurrence down the track? Um, I think this will be very important. So the key points here are using good, good technique, attention to detail, ensuring you get complete resection, using an adjuvant margin ablation technique to reduce recurrence, and, we, um, and snare tip soft coagulation is, is something that we use. Um, perhaps people that do resection, developing skills in scar detection and interpretation, should people be monitoring their local and personal recurrence rates? I think that's actually an important thing to do if you're running a service or um, doing it individually to make sure that you know your recurrence rates because they should be getting lower and lower. Um, and is there a recurrence rate that's a, that's a threshold for referral to an expert center? So if you're consistently getting recurrence rates in the 30% mark, 
perhaps you should be sending your lesions to um, an expert center to be done. Um, and can we use AI, the uh, perpetual question. Uh, so yes, thanks, thanks very much. Nick, this was great. Um, particularly, I want to congratulate you and, and uh, Michael Burke's group for the data that you just presented, probably for the first time publicly, um, because it was just put online from Gastro, the, the study on margin ablation and recurrence of a thousand patients, uh, several yep. centers not controlled by the recurrence rate. 3% if intention to treat and 1.4% if margin ablation was complete. Uh, to my mind, that seals it. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I know the randomized trial was already very surprising um, or like very convincing, but in, in kind of in this practice, having such a low recurrence rate just with margin ablation, it's, it's very impressive. Um, so just my, think, my short remark, Yuichi Daniel, if you want to comment on that or... Yeah, fantastic talk. Thank you. Fantastic uh, study. Um, my, my question is, since we also have the, the Heiko here as the, uh, with his uh, clip uh, proposing the prophylactic clipping, if you margin ablation, does your like defect size grows larger and is, is it more difficult um, just to apply clips? Also the anchoring, is it impaired in this, in this ablated tissue? No, not, not really. The, the marginal treatment is, um, is only a few millimeters at the edge, and it really doesn't impair or, or change the, your, your ability to clip the lesions up. You're just faced with the same problems that everyone has is if you've resected a 40 or 50 millimeter lesion, they're, they're just challenging to, to, to clip up. Um, and I think every, everyone finds that, but it doesn't really affect that. I think one other thing with the margin ablation that's important is it actually forces you to 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 go around the edge of your resection and mm -hmm. look, 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 and, and treat it. And, and, you, and, some, and quite often you'll get to a point and you'll say, oh, actually, I've just pulled back this fold and I've just treated it in here. And I don't think I've got that bit. So you go back and resect that with a snare. So you switch pattern. back to snare then? Well, you, the, snare's, the snare's used, the snare's there. So you can just, you can then yeah, potentially, or you may need to inject a bit more to resect that area. But, um, oh, oh, you know, that, that's, that's one of the key things, I think, about it that, that's um, very helpful. And it just makes you a little bit more meticulous, yeah. spend a little bit more time and helps with the overall outcome. Oh, so uh, thank you very much. I have one question to you. And also, I, I'd like to pick up some of the audience questions. So my question is very quick. Uh, what is the role of ESD given you, you gave a really nice result uh, with regard to the protect me combined with the ablation? Yeah, well, this is, this is the thing. So I think that um, I think that EMR for the majority of lesions in the colon, if we can get recurrence rates down to this sort of level, I think it, it, um, it's really uh, time efficient, it's, it's easy to do, and it's applicable to endoscopists all across the world. I know that that with ESD you, we're getting sort of recurrent we're getting um, recurrence rates that are very low as well, but there's a there's time that it takes there's skill, um, particularly to do lesions in the right colon. When it comes to the rectum, I think it's quite a different scenario. I think ESD um, for really anything that looks a little bit worrying um, or maybe anything over thirty millimeters in size or anything that's got a large nodule on it. I think ESD is the way to go now to make sure you've completely resected it. And also if, it's, if it hides a focus of um, uh, low risk T1 cancer, it can be curative for that. So I think that's, so I think really we have to have, uh, we have to use both modalities. I don't think that there's going to be a, um, you know, I don't think it's, you're one or the other. You've got to have the ability to do both um, and apply it to the correct situation. That's really interesting interpretation. Uh, I'd like to pick up one question from the audience from Professor Roland Ballori. Uh, so the question is, who should check for recurrence after the refer or the therapist? And what is the optimal interval to check for recurrence? Yeah, so the, the um, so, so our usual in, uh, um, interval is around is six months for the first uh, the surveillance colonoscopy um, and usually when we see recurrence there it's diminutive and unifocal and it's easy to resect 
So I think um, I, I think that's uh, th there is a question about whether or not if you've got a smaller lesion that's been resected on block, whether or not you can bring them back at 12 months. So we need some data around that to work out what uh, what to do there. But um, but for most of the lesions, we'd bring them back at, at six months. Um, we tend to do most of our first um, surveillance uh, at six months. Uh, you know, at, at where you know at the site of the at, at the tertiary institution where it's been done, and then after that, they typically can they may be able to return to the referrer. But I think one of the things is that um, we get uh, education about uh, looking at lesions and deciding what they are, and then resecting them and so on. But there's not so much about uh, looking for a scar. What does a scar look like? Um, what what does recurrence look like? Um, and so I think those are things that maybe have to be part of training programs now, or should, they really should be part of a training program. So you should be able to identify scars and, and really, really interrogate them. Thank you very much for your clear answer. It's very really helpful. Michael? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I've, it's a fascinating topic and uh, I think we're all working on trying to understand this better and to make it more uh, efficacious uh, polyp resection uh, and probably one of the next questions or that need to be answers and maybe we have already some guidance to that is when to use EMR and when to use ESD and what the outcomes are. The one thing I, I wonder is about the margin. So you showed in the prior study that extended margin doesn't really help but now ablation helps and probably is because with the extended margin we still miss something. Um, but I wonder whether if we applied something like similar to ESD, we just mark uh, the lesion in, in the normal mucosa before, and then we extend the margin to that, uh, that would be an alternative. Um, I've done that a couple of times. It's actually probably time-wise the same. You still, you know, you, you have to add more time doing this as in the same way you, you have to ablate afterwards. I'm not exactly sure what the benefit is. Um, I, I just think it should work in the same way, really, if, if you just make sure you are in the healthy margin uh, with the resection. Yeah, that's that's what we thought. So with the initial study we did was that extended margins, thinking that we'd, we'd sort of... Um, you know, look at that, but it really wasn't that effective. Um, and the margin ablation thing has, has, has worked very well. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the other thing too uh, that I think will come into the mix as well will be cold snare piecemeal EMR. Um, whether or not that's applicable for suitable adenomas is, is the next area. So I think there'll be this sort of spectrum of the techniques that we'll use yeah, from cold to ESD and it'll be making sure that you've selected the correct lesion and the correct modality um, to provide the best outcome for the patient. So I think that, that requires some more work. So it needs more work around margin ablation in the international community, like people to, like we've done it and shown, shown that's highly effective, but I think also other people doing it and showing that the effectiveness of it would be um, uh, helpful. And this, the cold snare thing, I think is gonna come to light too. Perhaps two, two additional comments, and then maybe Donnie wants to say something about this because I know he's always been active in that. Um, there is, um, it's interesting, uh, if you think about cold snare resection, uh, the question is, if you do cold snare, it, the benefit might be uh, uh, hardly any bleeding risks afterwards or perforation risks. Um, the, um, then you wonder, well, could we still ablate the margin? Um, and mm. Uh, the interesting thing that I just want to highlight is that in your study, it doesn't, at least in the randomized study, it doesn't seem that the, and also in this, this non-controlled study, that the bleeding risk is higher if you bleed the margin. So it doesn't seem like margin ablation increases bleeding risk. So maybe some ablative methods are permissible with cold snare resection. Yeah, I think, I think you're treating the margin, so you're not necessarily treating the defect or exposed vessels or anything like that. Right. So you're treating sort of what's deemed to be normal mucosa around the edges. Um, and it's also not that, not that, uh, it's not very, very deep, like, and it's just a mucosal ablation. Right. Um, so maybe that's part of it. Well, Tony, do you want to add anything? 
I think I think it, the, I really like the comment um, that it, it might be about lesion selection. You know that it's more like which which polyp. I have now all these techniques. I can go cold. I can go hot. I can combine hot and cold. Um, and plus, I can add different forms of margin ablation to just have have targeted techniques for the right polyp entity. You know, I'm, I'm we're yeah. doing Heiko is is leading this this uh, randomized trial, cold and hot. And sometimes it seems a bit, I, I see this polyp in front of me and now I'm forced for a very bulky polyp to attack this with a, with a 10 millimeter cold snare, which, which you know, doesn't, doesn't feel right. You know, I'm, right. I'm still doing it, but it's, it's, um, it's sometimes a challenge and it can be done. Um, the other point I found is this question from the audience with a follow-up um, really good, because we don't really have, have I, I feel, Oh, we're missing the year. No. Tani yeah. got lost. Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. And another, I, find that I found this question from the audience really important. What's the choice of, of surveillance interval? Because I have this series now of patients that got bounced because of the pandemic, because of cancellations from four months to 12 to 18 months with a follow-up. And I feel I there is a few more where I'm detecting recurrence at this interval. And I don't mm. know what, what, what you experience with your large series of EMRs. If you had the same, you got patient bounce to, to later follow up. Did you, did, do you have the feeling you find more um, um, recurrence? In a, in uh, we, yeah, I, I think certainly if, if um, yeah, I'm not sure how many we've sort of missed. We'd sort of try to be as, uh, as thorough and good as we can, but Certainly, if you if you pick them up earlier, mm -hmm. you're going to get, you know, very easy to deal with recurrence. Um, small, you know, you can deal with you know one snare resection and and maybe some ablation. Um, but yeah, theoretically, if you if they get left and turn up two or three years, mm -hmm. then you can you may be left with very challenging recurrence to deal with. And so yeah. I also wonder sometimes maybe it is it is not visible recurrence yet if, if we do a three months follow up and at nine months you have this you know five to ten millimeter you can easily treat but it, yeah. it doesn't show up in the studies as recurrence yet because um, it's too early to, to really see and then we biopsy the scar but we biopsy some you know area where we don't really assume you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't we don't see anything so it's not really time yeah. Yeah, so um, the, current re the current surveillance strategy that we use, uh, even out to surveillance colonoscopy two and three, um, the, the rates of recurrence are, are, are very, very low. So, you know, so um, but it's, it's been effective. And I think, uh, yeah, I would be, um, you know, I think bringing them back any earlier than six months isn't, re isn't really going to be that effective. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the key things is, yeah, to know what you're looking for at that recurrence examination, which I think is underdone at the moment, and um, to find the scar as well, know what that looks like. All right. Thank you, Nick. And thanks for staying up there late. <laughs> it's all right. So <laughs> have to go to work now. Yeah, soon. So we're kind of 50 minutes over time, and uh, I wish there would be some more interactive possibility with the participants. But uh, since we're over time, I, I think we're kind of ready to conclude our session. Uh, Dani, do you want to say anything towards the end? Yuichi? Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, Heiko. Thank you very much for having me a chance to co-chair this exciting session. I think we found a really important topics uh, uh, throughout the session, including the important direction in the future. And also we, we, we could identify some challenges even. Uh, I am so excited to expand this discussion towards the ongoing WO meeting. Uh, therefore, I'm really looking forward to the uh, next chance to, to see you and talk to you. Thanks. Yeah, I also want to want to say thank you to for these amazing presentations and the, the discussion. Also, Heiko, for your leadership um, through this all, and and I'm really really impressed by by what is what is what is coming up in endoscopy and new techniques and technology is pretty fascinating. All right.
Well, with that, um, it's been a pleasure to uh, kind of be the co-chair and chair of the past few years. And I'm, I know it's going to be in good hands with Dani and Yuichi. And uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. And uh, uh, the, the, the talks will be made available if the presenters agree to having those made available through the WEO website. Um, so, and yeah, thanks for being part of this and hope to see you soon in person at one point. Take care, everyone.